Usually in maths we talk about graphs as in these things where you can work out y values from x values and they show a continuous sweep of data. But in discrete mathematics that's not the case. A graph is something a bit different away from the conventional use of the word. So one of the most kind of famous examples if you would have ma of graphs in discrete mathematics is a train line. At first it doesn't seem like it, but it perfectly illustrates what a graph in discrete mathematics is. So train lines show these dots which represent the stations and they have different lines going through some stations and not the others. Now what makes this a graph? Well there are several things about this that are kind of the same to all discrete mathematic graphs. Now these stations are all the same distance apart. In reality the stations are probably varying distances apart like so but on the graph they're shown as all the same distance apart because this graph only shows the connectivity between the stations. All it does is say which stations are connected to what through which lines. It does not attempt to show any other property for example whether the uh, station is above or below ground it doesn't attempt to show the distances or the times between the stations on on the uh, lines between the dots or anything. So looking at it a bit more technically, in discrete maths we have the dots like the stations and these can be called nodes. You'll also see this written as vertices. And then we have the lines joining the dots which we call arcs. Or you can sometimes see this written as edges but mostly you will see them referred to as arcs and nodes. So when we're looking at these arcs and nodes they can have some quite cool properties about them. So nodes can be connected to themselves in loops with these looping arcs that could represent something like a roundabout or something like that. Uh, you can have multiple lines between two nodes that could represent different routes to do something. Now when we have these loops and these multiple arcs sometimes these things aren't appropriate. These really show quite unique properties about whatever these nodes represent because they could represent anything. They could represent computers, they could represent um, hydrogen atoms on a molecule of methane for example if I drew this this could quite easily be a molecule of CH4, this could be uh, a website with these different pages linking together, but sometimes th these types of graphs aren't appropriate. And when they, when they aren't appropriate, when we only have nodes being linked to other nodes through single arcs and never to themselves, we have a specific name for graphs like that, and that is simple graphs. because they are quite simple. So simple graphs only have connectivity between nodes with single arcs. So something like this. And they can be connected to multiple nodes but never to more than one node with more than one arc or to themselves. That's not a simple graph. So simple graphs can can have any number of nodes um, and wh when we add these nodes the number of something quite interesting happens so let's just draw out some some nodes so a graph with one node is quite simple it looks like that that is a simple graph it only has one node but then as soon as we add oh, that's a bit of a screwed up one there we go as soon as we have two nodes we again can have a graph like this where the nodes aren't connected to each other that's allowed you can have a graph where there isn't any arcs to show that there is no connectivity between things but you can also have a graph that does show the connectivity between these two arcs and then when we add three nodes to something we end up with a lot more possibilities of graphs we have the thing where none of them are connected we have it where only one of them is connected 
Remember, these different nodes represent different things, so these are two different graphs, even though if you just rotate this one 90 degrees, not 90 degrees, I suppose, it's going to be like a 101 degrees something. Anyway, when when you rotate this, you'll you'll end up with the same graph, but in this case, these are different graphs, because these two nodes represent different things. If this was A, B, and C, this is still A, B, and C. It, this just shows B and C are connected, and this is A and B is connected. And we can continue on like this, showing the different ways that we could connect the graph, of eventually getting to two nodes, and then finally ending up at three nodes. But there is something quite interesting. This graph here, every single other graph that we have drawn can be drawn from this graph. What I mean by that is if we look at, if we treat these nodes as all the same nodes, this one being A, B, and C, every single graph here can be represented on this graph. So this can be represented here, we can have this represented here, and so on and so forth. Because every one of these graphs is called a subgraph of this graph. And this is a property of simple graphs. We can also have graphs where the nodes are connected by precisely one arc to every other node. Like in this one where, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to draw there, where only, where the each node is connected to the other two nodes by precisely one arc each. And uh, this is also a complete graph. Every node is connected to the other node with only one thing in the middle, with only one arc between them, sorry. So we call those types of graphs complete graphs. Now, complete graphs can be written with a bit of notation. We can use the letter K for complete. I know it doesn't really make much sense, but anyway, that's just the way that we write it. So that means that a graph is complete and we can use a little n for the number of nodes. So for example, this graph here is k3, this graph is k2, and this graph is k1. So we could some another bit more complicated graph, k let's write let's draw k4. So k4 is gonna have four nodes and it says that every single node is connected to every other node by precisely one arc. There we go. But remember when we talked about subgraphs with these graphs? Well, an interesting property arises with complete graphs. We notice here that this complete graph is a subgraph of this graph. We could take this shape and put it into this graph. Same with this complete graph, we could say that this arc corresponds to this arc, or maybe this arc, or maybe this arc. And same with this complete graph with one node, obviously every node has that as a subgraph. Every graph has that as a subgraph, sorry. So there's quite a cool little property there, where every single graph has a subgraph of Kn for any sufficiently large number of n. So if we had like a k bazillion, any single graph that we draw with less than a bazillion nodes, we could find in that subgraph. We could find as a subgraph within that complete graph with a bazillion connections, because there are so many possible connections between these different nodes that we could find one that looked exactly like our graph. And that's kind of cool. But when we're talking about these complete graphs, there's another cool property. And that is the number of arcs between the nodes. You'll see here that the, we have, well, let's just tally up. So if we have one node, we have zero arcs. If we have two nodes, we have one arc. Uh, this is nodes, arcs. And then if we have three, well, we looked up here, we had these three arcs. So three, but when we have four, we had one, two, three, four, five. We had five arcs. So is there a way that we can tell the number of arcs with the number of nodes for a complete graph? 
And the answer is yes, it's a pretty cool little proof. So it comes as quite obvious that in a complete graph, every single node is connected to a specific number of nodes. And if we say that there are n nodes in a graph, every single node is having to be connected to n minus 1 node. And what I mean by that is if we have a graph like this, to be complete by definition, every node needs to be connected to every other node. And that means that when we have this n, every, we have three nodes, that is our n, and then that means that every node has to be connected to another node. So discounting itself, that means that every node has to be connected to two nodes. So using that, we can kind of figure out how many of these arcs we're going to have in a complete graph for any number of, of n in uh, the graph kn. So seeing as every graph is connected to another n minus, every node, sorry, is connected to another n minus 1 node, then that means it's at the end of n minus 1 arcs. So every single graph, every single node, I always get those two mixed up, is at the end of an arc. We're not looking at what the other half of the arc is connected to. We're just saying that every single arc ends in a node, so every single node must be at the end of an arc. And seeing as every node is connected to n minus 1 nodes, every node must be at the end of n minus 1 arcs. So it doesn't really matter what they're connected to, it's just saying that the arcs all lead towards these nodes, and seeing as these nodes have to be connected to every other node, we can say that every single node is connected to n minus 1 ends of arcs. So seeing as every arc has two, two ends to it, so now taking into account what is on the other side after the end of this abyss of the arc, we see that every arc has two ends. So if we know that there are n times n minus 1 arcs, because every node has to be connected to n minus 1 ends of arcs, seeing as every arc has two lengths, two ends, if we half this, we should get the number of arcs. And that's a pretty cool little property. You're probably not going to need it much, but it's kind of cool to think about. So there is one more thing, we're running out of space, but there is one more little uh, kind of subfamily of graphs that you need to know about, and that is called the bipartite graph. So the bipartite graph. And all the bipartite graph is, is something that shows connectivity between two separate groups. You probably remember something like this, like a problem, I think you can even be given these problems in year six, which say, okay, there are like three people and there are only two jobs available and uh, the person one let's say Kevin is able to do the first job which is like IT consultant the second person is able to do IT consultant and cleaner and then the third person can only do cleaner but that is a bipartite graph it shows these two groups that we can separate with people and jobs. That type of problem is a bipart bipartite graph. So in a bipartite graph the arcs only connect between nodes of one set to another. We call these different groups of nodes sets. So arcs only connect between sets. You can't have people connecting to people because that's not what the graph is showing. It's showing the relationship between people and jobs. So a, a graph like this can also be kind of complete graph. So there is something called a complete bipartite graph. And that looks like this, where every single node is connected to every node of the other set. So although every node isn't connected to every other node on the graph, it is a complete bipartite graph because we have these two different sets, A and B, that are connected to each other. And that's pretty cool. So that was 
the introduction to graphs. Next time we'll go on to uh, Euler and his ideas of uh, different ways to get round graphs. But that was just a simple introduction to set up for that. See you later.